gracious and eternal God. You call us into a new way of being and give us so many second chances in life. Open our eyes, our ears, our hearts and spirits this morning, Lord, that we may be healed of our faithfulness, freed from our fears and anxieties, and placed on the pathways that lead to peace and service to you. May your love wash over us as we turn toward you. Mold us as your people in new and powerful ways, that we may be true disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You will now please open your bulletins. We will join together in the call to worship. Lord, you are our God. We will, we will praise, praise you with joyful, joyful lips. Lord, you are our God. Our, our soul thirsts for your presence. Lord, you are our God. We behold your power and majesty. Lord, you are our God. We will bless you all the days of our lives. Look like the things Jesus would demonstrate. 
So what do you think Jesus would want us or have us behave? How would he want us to behave? Kind of like, you can make mistakes sometimes, but also have some good vibes in there. Yeah, very good. What? Kind of like a lemon sweet. Yeah, okay. I like this. You guys are so like mature. All right. So you're going to help me play this game. All right. I need the bigger kids to help. Yeah. I need you to lay out the circle in the middle of the floor. Okay? Lay that out. And then stand around it. Oh, it's a parachute. Well, put it right in the middle. Put it right in the middle. Center, please. I, I have this thing with balance. <laughs> put it in the middle. Okay, so Annabelle, stand with your sister so she can help you. So stand outside of it, and the center, beautiful rainbow circle is going to be a life with fruits of the Spirit. It's the colorful, wonderful, happy, joyful, good vibes life. Okay? And outside will be a life that is kind of not so good, not great choices. Okay, so you're going to stand up but not hold onto the handles. Okay, any time I mention something that sounds like fruits of the Spirit, how Jesus wants us to live, you're going to stand inside. And when I mention something that's not so great, you're going to stand outside of it. Okay? Ready? Easy one first. Love. Standing inside. Oh, nice. Um, mean to your friends. Excellent. Kindness. Patience. <laughs> yes. Jealousy. Grumpiness. <laughs> um, selfishness. Joy. Gentleness. Self control. Greediness.
As we enjoy the rich feast that the Lord has provided, we know that there are those who are hungry for food and drink. So we ask now that you are generous in your tithes and offerings so that we may bless our house of worship and also those in need for spiritual nourishment. And let's do this together as the ushers now wait upon the congregation for this morning's tithes and offerings.
you pray with me? <clears throat> Holy and loving God, as we have gathered here to lift up our praises and our worship, Lord, we are confident that you have received them. And now we come to a time when we kneel before you, a time when we confess our shortcomings, when we confess the things we have done that have been contrary to your will, and the things of your will that we have left undone. Lord, we confess that there are people who we have hurt, and Lord, we confess that there are thoughts that we have had that are not becoming of your people. So Lord, all these things, we confess and ask for your mercy to be poured out on us. <gasps> that we might truly understand how you are in our midst and how we are in your presence. And Lord, we pray that this would be the space in which we dwell, the space in which we are in touch with your Holy Spirit, where your word comes alive in our lives, and we begin to resemble your Son, Jesus Christ and we shine like stars in the darkness. Lord, this is our prayer, that we might be effective in letting people know of your great love, not just by words, but by seeing it in our actions, and by who we are. Lord, our prayers come closer to home, and um, Lord, we pray for those who are in this place who are carrying heavy loads. And we pray for those who are not in our midst, Lord, for all those who struggle with financial issues, with emotional issues, with physical illness and conditions, for those who are recovering from surgery and for those that are looking to surgery. Lord, we lift all of these people up to you. We see their names. We see their faces. And Lord, we lift them up to you, not just so that you might do something, but Lord, we pray that as we lift up these, these thoughts, these prayers, that we are somehow changed. That we would come to understand how we are agents of your kingdom. <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, we offer up prayers for us. Lord, often we keep the things that we need and the things that we struggle with so close to our chest. We keep them private. And we find it easier to ask for prayers for others. But we will take a moment of silence, Lord, to open up our hearts to you. We acknowledge you already know what is going on inside us that you already know what we need to ask for, and yet, Lord, we take this moment to be humble and to say how we need you. <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray that your gentle hand would always correct our course, that we might find our way in the way of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Sin, repentance. How do those words feel? How, how, how's that for an opening to a sermon, huh? When we hear those words, we're often put on our heels, right? And it kind of sparks up that, that idea of, of judgment and an angry God, you know, up in heaven with this big beard, an angry old man saying, Get off my grass! angry because of our flaws and ready to bet out justice upon us. Right? You know, our unease with these words is not unfounded. Um, a couple weeks ago, there was um, um, a demonstration that showed up in front of Thousand Oaks High School. Uh, the Westboro Baptist Church showed up to pick it because they felt that the shootings that happened at the borderline were part of God's judgment upon American society. And they held up signs of judgment. 
Times that said repent. Times that said God hates and you can fill in the blank whatever you want after there. And if you aren't familiar with Westboro, they're a small Baptist church from Kansas. Most of the members of that church belong to one family. And they turn out and protest at things like high schools, political rallies, religious gatherings, and funerals of American soldiers who've been killed in action. And they carry those same signs wherever they go. They're really everywhere, almost ubiquitous, and it shows up on the news, and they go because people send money to them to fund their travels so that they can go and show up at these places with their signs. God hates. Repent. And their message is a simple one. They simply believe that everything bad that happens is caused by an angry God. A God who is so angry about sin that he causes bad things to happen. And he's not the only one that has this message. I, I try not to speak about other preachers, but I'm going to speak about Pat Robertson today. He never wastes any time blaming any of the natural disasters that happen in the world on an angry God who is judging people for their evil sin. And he usually follows this up with a warning to America. If we don't repent, God is going to remove his blessing upon us as a nation. And on a more personal level, I, I know of several people who it seems that about every other month are posting in their social media that you know, things like, I know bad stuff is happening in my life, but I know it's because I'm not right with the Lord, and, and God is causing these things to happen so that I might return to Him. We all struggle and squirm whenever we hear the word sin and repentance. And yet this morning, that's exactly what I have to preach about. Sin and repentance. But we're going to do it in a little different vein based upon the scripture that we read today. We're going to talk about it as a part of God's grace, as a part of God's love, as a part of God's patience. And I hope that Jesus' own words and teaching are going to serve as a necessary corrective to our common understanding of these words. This morning's passage begins it's the end of a longer discord that actually begins in uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 1. And throughout this, this period of teaching, Jesus is representing God as a judge, but also with the promise of God's mercy and provision. And the teaching that happens immediately before this morning's passage is about interpreting the times and settling with your opponent so that you won't be dragged in front of the judge. And it's a little bit of a strange teaching, but it sets up what happens in our passage today. You need to remember that Jesus and his 12 closest disciples are from Galilee. They're Galileans, and they're on their way to Jerusalem. And immediately after talking about settling with your opponents, there's a voice that comes up from probably other Galileans who are asking Jesus to, or telling him, you know, Pilate killed some Galileans and mingled their blood with the sacrifice. The sacrifice that was being given in the temple. And you see, when this happens, it would have rendered that sacrifice unworthy to be given. And Jesus wastes no time letting the people what he thinks about this story. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, but he says, do you think this happened because they were sinners? No. No, that wasn't the reason. In fact, let's consider the 18 people that died when the towers of Siloam fell over and crushed them. Did that happen because they were terrible sinners? No. No, that wasn't the reason. And you see, Jesus is taking people's common understanding of what we call retributional justice, that God sought to punish and curse people for their sins, 
and the righteous were rewarded with wealth and power. He hears them saying this, and he insists that while they're wrong, they still need to repent. And I want to stop and pack that for a moment. You see, Jesus doesn't affirm that God is the one who caused people's misfortune in this story. And yet, even as he says that, that doesn't unlink sin from, the, uh, from being the agent of the bad things that have happened. And here, let me explain. So Pilate's murder of people in a place of prayer and worship is sinful. It's sinful. And maybe the people hadn't sinned, but Pilate did. And then something awful happened. And we don't know the whole story about the toppling of the towers, but maybe they fell over because there were shortcuts in the construction of it, and they weren't made right. And because of someone's greed, they fell over and crushed innocent people beneath them. So again, sin could have been a causative agent in the story, but it wasn't the people who suffered. It wasn't their sin. It was someone else's. And in the towers, if it was an earthquake, well, then this is a bad thing that happened. God didn't make it happen as punishment. Bad things happen all the time, and sometimes, well, we get in the way of them. Let's be honest. There are times in which our, direct, our decisions and our choices have consequences. And sometimes those consequences are faced by innocent people who've done nothing wrong. It was about a year and a half ago when I was... Uh, pastoring up in Valencia, and I got a phone call. A bright young man who had just graduated from high school had been killed the night before. Colin Gore, great kid, great kid. And here's the thing, Colin hadn't done anything wrong. He was a great kid, he'd been over at his friend's house, he was coming home, because he had agreed with his mom he'd be home by midnight. It was about 11.45 and he was coming up McBean Parkway on his way home. Someone else was going the other direction. And they were driving too fast and they clipped the curb and lost control of their car and it came over the median and it took out Colin and his car. Colin was killed instantly. The man who was driving the other car, he ended up dying as well. And he left behind his wife, who was eight months pregnant with their first child. One bad decision. One bad decision. One bad choice. And what ends up happening is that gets meted out. The consequences are played out upon a family. Two families and an entire community. Over 1,200 people showed up for Collins' memorial service. Sin does cause suffering. But the suffering is a consequence rather than punishment enacted by God. So when we talk about sin, we should be talking about it in almost a technical sense. Sin is the distance from where you are as compared to where you should be. In archery, they, they say that if you miss the bullseye, wait, the distance measured from your arrow to the bullseye is, is actually referred to as sin. In orienteering, if you're out and about, you the distance from where you are to where you're supposed to be can be referred to as sin. <coughs> And in that same vein, when we talk about repentance, technically it means turning around. It means turning around and going in the other direction. But really, it means correcting your sin. 
correcting the distance from where you are to where you need to be. And we should take these two terms seriously, not judgmentally, seriously, because they are devices of grace which help us to get back to where we need to be, where God needs us to be to do God's work, to get back to where we are in the middle of God's will. And to explain this, Jesus uses his parable of the fig tree. A man goes to his vineyard, and there's a fig tree in his vineyard that isn't producing fruit. So he goes to the gardener and says, Tear this tree out. It's not bearing fruit. And the gardener says, No. Let's dig around it. Let's care for it. Let's water it. Let's fertilize it. And next year, let's see if it's producing fruit. And the man agrees. The gardener is probably the one who planted the tree. The gardener is the one who loves the tree and has cared for the tree up to that point. And it's the gardener who understands that it takes time for a tree to bear fruit. When we read this story, we always want to say the man is God and Jesus is the gardener and we are the tree. And it, that's a, a worthy way of looking at it. Yet another way is simply to say that God is the gardener. God is the gardener. And we can either be the man who loses patience with the tree, or we can be the tree who's just trying to grow and become what God wants it to be, what God has intended it to be, to bear the fruit that God has for it. And in this time, it is God who understands that it takes time to grow. It is God who understands that it takes time to become what we've been planted to be. It's God that responds with compassion. When I was growing up, we, I always had to help Dad out in the yard, and sometimes I was more helpful than others. But there was one time when we were out front, and we were pulling weeds and the, the planter that was next to the street and, and there was this one strange plant and I grabbed hold and got ready to pull it up and my dad said, Mijo, don't pull that one. I said, Why? And as my dad, but he, he always wanted to be a farmer, he looked at it and he said, I want to see what it's going to become. I want to see what it's going to become. Let's, let's wait another week and see what it's going to become. And so every time I went out, and we would think he'd say, no, no, leave that one. I want to see what it's going to become. And it's become this beautiful oak tree that still stands in our front yard. It's massive. It's like 25 feet high. It's broad. It brings shade. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous oak tree. All because my dad said, don't pull that one up. Don't pull that one up. I want to see what it's going to become. See, God wants to see what we're going to become. God wants to see that we are going to be able to provide the fruit, those fruits that Patty was talking about in the child, children's moment, those fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. There's more. I, I always lose track after self-control. But, uh, <laughs> but there, there's nine of them. Nine fruits of the Spirit that are supposed to, that we are supposed to produce as a result of our being rooted in God's Word and in the Holy Spirit. And when we're doing God's work, and those, those fruits become present. And the naked are clothed, and the hungry are fed, and the thirsty are given something to drink, and those who mourn are comforted. And the kingdom of God becomes real around us. And this scripture should hit us in two spots. One is individually, close. Jesus calls us to change our hearts and our lives. 
so that we might bear fruit. To take account of our sin and to repent so we get back to where God needs us to be and wants us to be. Repentance is an important part of that process. And we also need to take our sins seriously. Our decisions and our choices have ramifications. Sometimes we get lucky and they seem to, we make bad decisions and, well, we're the only ones that suffer from it. But that's not always the case. Sometimes we don't take sin seriously enough. And because we don't, we're not able to change our direction and get back to where we need to be. But it's also important that we're kind with ourselves in the midst of this. And, and kind with each other. Because it takes time to grow. There's a, a, a very famous story that goes in, in, in leadership development. And they say that, you know, it, it's always in a variety of different guises. But someone goes in and sits down with the CEO. The first time I heard it was the CEO of IBM. And this young executive says, sir, what does it take to get to be the CEO? And he says, one thing, experience. And the guy says, okay, well, how do I get experience? And the guy leans forward and says, you make mistakes. You make mistakes. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to make bad decisions. We're going to make terrible choices at times. But it's all a part of figuring out how to get into that place where God needs us to be. And repentance is that tool of grace that allows us to get back so that we're not at the center of our lives, but rather that mix of God and the world and ourselves comes together and life suddenly makes sense, and good things are happening all around us. You see, God's patient enough to allow that to happen. God's patient enough because he wants us to grow to be fruitful. But then collectively, it hits us in a different way. How do we represent the God of Jesus Christ to the world? How do we hold together God's judgment and at the same time God's mercy and patience? How do we take those things seriously without becoming judgmental ourselves? How do we more fully participate in the mercy and patience part of this equation? And where is God calling us as a church? To liberate people. To liberate people from sin and whatever is holding them back from a whole and holy life in God. It takes time to grow. Be patient with yourself. Be patient with one another. But remember, as you take account of your life, and if you find yourself in a spot you don't belong, or if you find yourself a little to the right or the left of what God is doing, remember to repent, to correct your way, so that we get in with the current of God's spirit, of God's love, of God's mercy, and that we might bear the fruit that God has planted us to bear. Let's make like trees and grow, right? Amen. Today is Congregation Participation Day in Special Music, so please open number 2214. Join me on the refrain. And I would also add to uh, get out your best Elvis Presley spiritual gospel voice and sing it loud. <laughs>
spending your important worship time here with us. Right along the top of the back of the bulletin is contact information. So please reach out to us. Let us know how we can help you and be here for you. You can also see the events for the week. I want to highlight God Talk on Tuesday, March 26, 8 p.m. This is at the District Pub on Lancashire, and it's led by Pastor Steve. They had their first God Talk this past Tuesday, and I heard it went really well. Also, Thursday, March 28th, we're having our continued student supper and vespers at 7 o'clock in the lounge, and then we continue at 7.30 with our Lenten Bible study with Pastor Steve living the Jesus Creed. And on Sunday, March 31st, the Methodist men are meeting at the Navarro home in Northridge. So you can see all the information for um, how to get over to their house there. Also, you can see the ultra flower dedications, and I'd like you to please pull out the insert inside. And I want to give you an update on our Easter basket mission. Um, the Easter baskets this year, again, will be going to Hope of the Valley Rescue Missions Family Shelter Women's Shelter. Um, they're really excited to receive them again this year. And you have three Sundays to get those donations in, but please make note, all the chocolate bunnies and all the stuffed animals have been donated, and all the toys and trinkets, and all of the plastic Easter eggs with candy. Now, if your life is not complete, if you can't, you know, if you feel like, I have to fill in some candied eggs, do it anyway. We'll have extra, and some baskets will get extra eggs. That's wonderful. But thank you to those that have donated so far. Um, we can use more pretty, shiny, foil-wrapped candies that can be kind of loose in the basket that look fun and pretty. But you can see all of our needs um, that we are looking for here. Prep day is coming up on April 13th at 11.30 a.m. in the lounge. We're going to organize and get our assembly line ready, which is going to happen on Palm Sunday, where we'll put together all of these baskets. So if you have friends or family that would love to do a mission project, invite them on Palm Sunday, um, and they can join us and put together these beautiful, beautiful baskets for children in need. If you look on the back side of the insert, it is the flyer for the 12th Annual Multicultural Potluck. This is a collaborative event that we do with the school. I can't believe it's been 12 years already. And we're going to have a little change. Instead of it all being crammed inside of the social hall, we're going to actually open it up. So food and entertainment, everything will kind of be between the social hall and outside in the school quad. So, we're going to have entertainment that you can see listed here. Um, my Hula sisters will be there dancing, which probably means I'm going to be dancing. And then um, fourth graders are going to be singing, the sixth graders are going to be singing, and there's even spoken word poet. Great entertainment. If you can come, we'd love for you to wear your traditional dress or your heritage if you'd like. Um, if you'd like to bring your favorite dish from your family recipes, bring a dish to share. If you'd like to make a table centerpiece, we have five of them we need to make, let me know, and we'd love to add you to the list. This will be so fun, and we really hope to see you. Again, that's April 12th, and it sounds like it's 5 o'clock to 8, which is a little early. I feel like it starts at 6, but it says 5 to 8 currently, so I will check that and let you know next week. And again, just so you know, they're expecting over 250 people. So it's going to be a lot of fun with the school, and we really want more church people to come. So please let me know if you can join. And with those things in our hearts and minds, let us conclude this morning's worship service. Stand if you're able, opening your red hymnals to number 577, God of Grace and God of Glory.
So may we be filled with patience and peace as we take time to grow, to become what God has planted us to be. May we bear the fruit of God's kingdom in the world around us. Go in peace. Go in power. Amen. As we go.